Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the fascinating history of Christian mysticism from the early days of the church until today. I'm Alberto de la Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carlos Ayer, the T. Larson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. Welcome back, Carlos. Good to be back, Alberto. It's great to be back. Good, good. Welcome to the last month of our show, of our first year, our first season. And it's been a wild ride, but I've enjoyed every every episode of it. I have too. And I can't believe how quickly time has passed. That's the only thing. It it's seems like, to speed up with every year. Oh, yeah. Pretty soon uh, we will be in uh, what Meister Eckhart called the eternal now moment. <laughs> <laughs> it feels that way. <laughs> If we haven't gotten there already. Before we get started, I want to remind all our listeners that if you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, please click the like button so you don't miss another episode. Now, we had a great episode last time with St. Joseph of Cupertino. Who do you have for us this time, Carlos? Well, we're going back in time, back uh, about as early as, as one can go in the history of Christian mysticism. We're going to St. Anthony the Great, also known as Anthony of the Desert, who lived, this is remar remarkable, between 251 and 356. Supposedly, he died at age 105. And it helps to keep in mind that when he was born, 251, that was uh, the beginning of the worst period of persecutions of Christians was the last half of the third century and beginning of the fourth century. So he was already 42 years old when Emperor Constantine finally legalized Christianity. But yeah, living to 105, practicing constant self-denial. We'll get back to this later, but yeah, the fact is that he was not only healthy up until the, the very end. But his uh, hagiographer, St. Athanasius, made sure he pointed out, Anthony never lost any of his teeth. Although they were a bit worn down, he said. He kept all his teeth till age 105. I'm sure a lot of us wish they could say that. <laughs> yes. At half most, that age. <laughs> most definitely. Yes. So there's a miracle in and of itself. Of course, you know, we don't know for certain if that's true, uh, but it's, that's the accepted tradition. Now, St. Anthony of the Desert is known as the father of monasticism. Is that correct? That's right. That's the title given to him. He was not the first. But he was among the first. The Christians began to flee into the desert in places like Egypt and Syria, even while persecutions were being carried out. Historians have made a, a practice of arguing that monasticism became popular because persecution ceased, right? So it was a form of self-inflicted martyrdom. But the fact that they were monks before persecution ceased tells us, I think, a, a different story about why men and women fled from civilization, basically, and went out to the desert to follow what they interpreted as Jesus' command to sell everything you owned and follow him, and also to imitate his 40 days in the desert. So there's a bit of imitation going on also among Christians who did this. And we don't know for sure how many men and women went out to the desert or who was the absolute first to do so. But Anthony, while still a young man, in church one day the gospel passage was read where Jesus says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And hearing that moved him so much that he immediately gave away everything he had and went to the desert. Now, we don't know 100% for sure what gave him that idea, but it's pretty clear that there were others who had done that already and that there was a pattern being established that living a life of absolute self-denial and total poverty this is the, the third component, very important. Constant prayer was already assumed to be a, an ideal way to follow Jesus. 
Didn't he come from a very wealthy family? Yes, his family had property, and he had a sister that he gave some of his uh, property to so that you know she could continue to live in style that they had been living before, maybe, maybe a little less than that. But yes, he had property to give away. That's the important point. Yeah, it's a good thing you brought that up because not everyone who went to the desert had property to give up. As a matter of fact, I've read some studies that suggest that some of those men and women who went out to the desert had gone bankrupt and couldn't pay back their loan. Anthony was not in that kind of trouble at all. He had stuff to give away. So we've established that he may have not been the first, but is considered the father of monasticism. How does he play into the mysticism? How does his life... Yeah, well, you know, we don't have any texts written by Anthony. We only have descriptions of his mysticism in the hagiography written by St. Athanasius of Alexandria, who details the life story of Anthony. And in many ways, he's very, you know, he's similar to Francis of Assisi in this respect. Francis wrote very little. Yet he is uh, known as one of the greatest mystics in the Christian tradition because we have all of these descriptions of his life and his mystical ecstasies and miracles performed by him. So Anthony is, is a role model for mystics. And as a matter of fact, you know, it was reading the life of Anthony by Athanasius that pushed St. Augustine deeper into wanting to become a Christian. He wanted to imitate Anthony and was upset with himself that he could not bring himself to give up his, you know, fairly cushy life. And, well, for Augustine, there was an additional problem, the self-denial part. Uh, Augustine did not think that he could live a celibate life. And he was very upset by that. So actually, St. Anthony has been a role model for many other individuals who ended up becoming monastics and also mystics. And the two key elements of the lifestyle, you know, I know it's a word Americans like to use a lot, lifestyle. The lifestyle that Anthony established was one of self-denial and constant prayer. And for this reason alone, he and St. Athanasius, the man who wrote his life story, are inseparable. Because without Athanasius telling the story, we wouldn't have Anthony as the model for others much less as father of monasticism. But uh, historians think that, yes, this man really existed and really did achieve incredible things. And the fact that Athanasius, who was a very busy bishop, we'll get to him later, took time and thought it was important to write Life of Anthony for theological reasons, right? It's, It's a theological lesson. That says volumes about what Anthony achieved. You know, I think it's important what you just brought up a few moments ago about the way the West view the term lifestyle, living in the lifestyle you've become accustomed to. And I think it's important that that we look at someone like St. Anthony of the desert and people like him when they decided to become monastics, to become hermits, to go out into the literal desert. It's not like, you know, you're downsizing from a big home to an apartment and from your big car to a bicycle, you're really roughing it. This is That's right. You're yes. living in prehistoric times. Yes, and you're living on the edge of survival, basically. Because, you know, there was no there was kind of a network among these hermits. They kept in touch with each other and so on. But there was no overarching organization that would keep an eye on you or anything of the sort. And it's quite possible and quite likely that many of these men and women who went out to live as hermits in the desert might have fasted too much, died from hunger, or for for other reasons, died alone out in the desert. It's quite likely. During some archaeological digs, they have found skeletons of some of these hermits, and they were I am not sure if they were like buried properly, but I I can envision very easily someone like St. Anthony, definitely not surviving to 105, but 
running into real trouble out there. It's, it was a dangerous thing to do, you know, not to mention the wild animals. Yeah, and today you have people that, you know, they go, they call it going off the grid where they'll just leave society, go off into the woods and disconnect from the world and just live off the land. But, you know, a lot of them take some Coleman lamps with them, stoves, guns, equipment, an axe, yeah. hammer, nails, tools, and it is roughing it. It is a difficult life out there by yourself and growing your own food. But back in the year 200, the year 300, the best I guess they could hope for was to have a, a knife or a machete or, or something with yeah. them and, and maybe a pot. But, you know, you're making – you don't have stoves. You don't have light. You don't have no any weapons. No. And in the case of Anthony, actually, you know, so you go out to the desert. So where, where do you find a place to live in the desert? You know, especially in Egypt, which is where he lived, right? So he leaves the, the Nile River area, which is the, you know, this thin little green strip where most Egyptians live. You don't have to go very far from there. You're in absolute desert and it's a sudden transition. So where do you go? In St. Anthony's case, he actually went to live in a cemetery. He was living in graves. You know, keep in mind, this is Egypt. So there were probably some fairly large tombs, like a like w what we would find in, in our cemeteries, like a pantheon, right? And probably underground. And he found one that was empty, and that's where he was living. He was living among the dead for years and years and years. That's how he started. So that's pretty extreme. And one has to ask oneself, what drives anyone to do this? My answer as a historian, is that it had been established as a pattern already before he came along. Who the first person to do this is, of course, is Jesus, who goes to the desert, but he only goes to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. But before him, who do we have living in the desert? John the Baptist. And before John the Baptist, we have those Jewish Essene communities that, you know, remove themselves from their Jewish society to live apart and live a life of self-denial and prayer. And John the Baptist is, is the perfect example. So th there were models, right? But the thing is that we don't have mystical texts from these hermits, including Anthony, but we do have collections of their sayings, collections of their life stories, which we've dealt with briefly before. But in the case of Athanasius, you have the first full Alone biography that becomes immensely popular in Christian communities. So much so that Augustine read it, and he read it in a Latin translation, because the original is written in Greek. So uh, Augustine was born almost exactly the same time that Anthony was in his late 90s. So Anthony died in 356. Augustine was born in 354. <laughs> They overlapped by two years on the calendar. The world had changed so much, though, between 251 and 354. It's just incredible. But by then, Anthony was, was already super well-known by the time that uh, Augustine was in his 30s, so in the 380s. So with all the information we have from St. Athanasius, tell us a little bit about some of the mystical experiences that St. Anthony went through. Yeah, you know, it is uh, remarkable to go through the various steps undertaken by Anthony because the whole point for Athanasius writing this life of Anthony was to prove to other Christians what transformative power Jesus really had on all humans. So his mysticism is all about how he transforms his life into one in which he is in basically constant communication with the divine. The emphasis on constant, right? And what that relationship that he establishes with God, this direct relationship, how it changes him. So step by step, you know, he goes out to live in the tombs. And of course, there is a very loose-knit community of hermits. They kind of look out for each other. People 
sometimes bring food out to them, and this is how they survive. But he's basically alone most of the time, praying and fasting. And we know from the sayings of the Desert Fathers that some of these hermits went to extremes with their fasting. He's living in the tombs, and the closer he starts getting to the divine, and and here's how the story is told, right? He starts being assailed by demons. And this is critical, and this is crucial part of the story. Demons come not just to tempt him, which they do constantly, but he, he actually has to struggle with them physically. And sometimes they attack him physically, according to Athanasius. And then we don't have any idea exactly how many years this takes, but at one point there is uh, one encounter that he has with demons where he's just basically at the end of his rope. And suddenly a light breaks through and Jesus himself comes in and says to Anthony, don't worry, I have power over these demons and they won't be able to hurt you anymore. And Anthony says basically, well, where were you all this time? (laughs) Where were you? Where was your help when I really needed it? What is this? Basically like Jesus on the cross saying, oh my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Right? And Jesus says, I was here all along. I was here helping you. This is why they have not been able to overcome you. I was here the whole time. But basically like a good athletic coach, he says, I I wanted to make sure you do this on your own, but not entirely on your own, of course, because I was here helping you. But I I wanted you to learn from this, that you can resist. You can resist temptation. You can can imagine the artwork on St. Anthony uh, has imagined all sorts of temptations for him. And there are numerous, numerous paintings of St. Anthony being tempted. It was a very popular theme in, in medieval art, as well as early modern and Baroque art. And even uh, the surrealist painter uh, Salvador Dali has a painting of St. Anthony in the desert. But the point is, after this, this breakthrough moment when Jesus comes in, speaks to him, assures him, he will always vanquish the demons. Anthony keeps getting more adept, right? More expert at his life of self-denial. And people start coming to him. So here's a, a parallel with the life of Joseph of Cupertino, right? You can become a very popular monk. People start hearing about you and about how, how great a monk you are. And, and Well, they come to see him. But he wants greater solitude. So with God's guidance, he is led to a very remote location, farther out into the desert, where he finds an oasis and he lives the rest of his life in this oasis. But then what happens in this oasis is truly remarkable. As Athanasius tells the story, he eats very little, but he has date trees in his oasis. So he has at least dates to eat, right? So he's not going to starve to death, at least not very quickly. But he can, he, he also uh, still gets visits, not as many as as. The whole reason he went there was to not have too many visitors. But in this little oasis, it is like paradise, as Athanasius tells the story. Because like Adam and Eve in the garden, he is in constant communication with God. And he is pretty much in command of nature, his own nature, his own body. He's very much in command of his own body. You know, he can live with you know, minimal intake of food. But also, the wild beasts can't harm him because he can command them. Whatever he says, he says, leave me alone, they leave him alone. So basically, he talks to the animals. He talks to God. People start coming to see him and talk to him. And and, and not just common people, but of course, leaders in the church come out to seek his advice. Because this is the point. The transformation that has taken place is... This man who has not had much of an education now, his sole education has been his communication with God, is being sought out by church authorities. And at one point, he ends up being asked to debate philosophers and theologians, and he proves himself smarter than all of them. (laughs) He has 
the gift of what is known as infused knowledge. And here's where we have to take a, a slight detour into a subject that is huge for this time period. Athanasius is living through one of the most difficult times in the definition of Christian belief. The issue is how to define Christ. Who is Jesus, right? Who is Jesus of Nazareth? He's a man. Everybody agrees. Yes, he was a man. That's all. Yes, he was a man, but he was also somehow divine. So the question is, okay, so Jesus is human. Jesus is divine, but how is he divine? He's known as the Son of God, but what does that mean? Oh, and there are so many disagreements about how to speak about Christ and how to define his divinity. What became the most popular definition at that time, we're talking early 4th century, is theology of Christ, a Christology, developed by an Egyptian cleric, Arius, A-R-I-U-S. And Arius was very logical, and he had been very well trained. And Arius argues, yes, Jesus is God, but he is lesser than God the Father, because he's a son, right? He's not the same thing. God the Father and God the Son are two different levels of divinity. So, in essence, he is a lesser kind of God than God the Father. And Arianism becomes immensely popular. Actually, it takes over a century. No, more than that. It takes several centuries for Arians, as Arius' followers came to be known, to cease to exist. And at one point, St. Jerome said, this is fourth century, the world has become Arian because actually Emperor Constantine, the emperor who legalized the Christianity and himself at the end of his life became a Christian, he was baptized by an Arian bishop. And some of his sons who followed him on the throne were also Arians. So, how does Anthony get involved in this? Anthony gets involved that dispute he was sent to. He was debating with Arians. And, of course, according to Athanasius, he proved them all wrong. But the reason that Athanasius chose to write a life of Anthony is that he thought Anthony proved through his life and through his mysticism, so convincingly that Christ, Jesus, was fully divine, equally divine with the Father. And that, more importantly, by becoming a human being, God had transformed human nature. So here's the lesson in Anthony and his mysticism. We've talked about this before, this concept of divinization, right? That the the mystic undergoes a transformation that is profound. You know, they're still human, 100% human, and still somewhat flawed, but their human nature and their capabilities are raised to a much higher level. And this divinization is known in Greek as theosis, becoming godlike. So this debate with the Arians is, is one of the more important elements in his life story and in his mysticism. Without having studied philosophy or theology, Anthony can construct arguments and demolish all these wise philosophers who have all kinds of very precise terminology and put them in their place. So he becomes infinitely wise with infused knowledge and, you know, infinitely holy through his self-denial. And Arians are condemned in 325 at the very first church council, the Council of Nicaea, convened by none other than Emperor Constantine. They're condemned, but that's not the end of the story. Arians keep insisting on their point of view, and there will be more councils and more definitions. And actually, an entire Germanic tribe, the Visigoths, are converted to Christianity by Arian missionaries. So basically, you've got two churches in existence in the 4th century. One Orthodox, which follows the Council of Nicaea and says Christ is fully human and fully divine. And Arians who say 
he is not the same kind of divine as God the Father. And it gets very complicated. There are Arians who then propose, okay, so Jesus is not the same kind of divinity as the Father, but how about if we say he's a similar nature to the Father? (laughs) That's known as semi-Arianism. They too end up being condemned. But anyway, back to Anthony. The point Athanasius is trying to make is that the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ did something to human nature. It changed it. It gave humans the ability to do something that humans were not able to do before the incarnation. And it's like a formula for Athanasius. God became a man, or let me rephrase it, God became human so that humans could become divine. And Athanasius wrote a lot, unlike Anthony. And one of his most influential texts is on why God became man, on the incarnation. His treatise on the incarnation explains in great detail why it was God needed to become a human in order to rescue the human race. And Athanasius, who has been caught in all sorts of conflict with Arians and church authorities who are Arian and civil officials who are Arian, will be exiled five times for defending the full divinity of Christ. And in the midst of all this turmoil, he writes this biography or hagiography of Anthony to prove to the world the transformative power of belief in Jesus and of following the model of life proposed by Jesus. So once again, we come across a mystic who didn't write much or didn't write anything at all, but has such an enormous, such powerful influence on the development of Christian mysticism and so much of an impact on others who want to have that kind of close relationship with the divine. It's hard to imagine the kind of life these monastics that went out into the desert lived. Can you tell us a little bit what was it like, what their lives were like, what did they do, what were the... You know, I imagine they, they all went to extremes because going out to live in the desert is an extreme action. Yes. You know, the descriptions we get from the sayings of the Desert Fathers point to a certain looseness when it comes to control. Yes, they occasionally, you know, these hermits, they're, you know, being Christian also means being part of a community, part of the church, right? So they do meet together sometimes because you've got that, you know, Keep in mind also that there are sacraments, and they, they need that. So there's there's plenty of communication among them. And actually, some of the older hermits serve as teachers or guides for the younger hermits. But we know for sure that they fasted to extreme. And we know for sure that some of their fasting included dietary practices that were pre-Christian, such as, you know, assigning a certain value to certain kinds of food, which foods were cleaner or more spiritual. And for instance, the most uh, spiritual kind of food, and this predates Christianity, were like melons and cucumbers. (laughs) They had less of an effect on your body. And this might sound odd to us because we know so it's so different. Vegetarianism was part of this practice. And one reason for not eating meat is that it was generally believed that whatever you ate became part of you and affected you. So eating animals changes your human nature to some extent. And especially animals who reproduce through sexual intercourse. If you eat them, their flesh that you eat, increases your lustfulness, right? So it makes it harder for you to be celibate and not have sex. So there's one story for, you know, to show exactly how these men and women trained themselves. This comes from the sayings of the Desert Fathers, that there was a monk who was trying to conquer his will and conquer his will in regards to eating, to eat as little as possible. So the story goes like this. To teach himself discipline, 
he hung a cucumber in front of himself so that he would have to look at it. He said, uh, well, I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to eat it for two hours. And he'd stare at it for two hours. And then two hours are up, says, no, no, I'll go another two hours. <laughs> and then same thing over and over. No, another two hours, another two hours. Well, you know, it's very difficult for people who live in an affluent country to think that somebody might be hankering after a cucumber, right? <laughs> oh, what a temptation. But that's all you've got to eat. That's all you have to eat. So anyway, he goes on up for hours and hours and hours. And the end result is, of course, you know, he finally eats it because he doesn't want to starve to death. But he felt guilty for wanting that cucumber at all. And these are the kinds of excesses that are done away with in collective monasticism. Once you begin to have collective monasticism, which also begins in Egypt, and you have abbots or abbesses and rules that govern the lives of these men and women and actually protect them from going to excess, then things begin to change. And another such story, for instance, how extreme these ascetics could be in denying their bodies, denying their, their own sexuality, especially, is the story of these monks, these hermits. And this proves to us that they got together and sometimes spent a fair amount of time together. A number of hermits were traveling together with their older hermit, and off in the distance they see a group of monastic women, and they're afraid that their paths are going to merge. So they immediately take off in a different direction. And then at some point, and it's not clear if it was days later or hours later, they just happened to end up in the same place, this group of women and the group of men. And the older woman, basically the abbess, says to the abbot of the men, Hey, why did you run away from us when you saw us off in the distance? We saw you. And um, he says, Well, course. You're women. We didn't want to come near you. And the abbess replies, well, if you were a true monk, a really good monk, you wouldn't have even noticed that we were women. <laughs> so there it is, uh, in a nutshell, the way in which these men and women could go to real extremes. There's another story about a monk, a hermit, who somehow, his mother has come to see him. So we know that they have, you know, exchanges with the rest of the world. And then they they have to go from one place to another. And they have to cross a river. And he has to carry his mother on his back. But he doesn't want to touch her with his hands. So he wraps his hands up so his skin does not touch her skin. This is his mother, right? And the, the mother asks when they get to the other side of the river, why did you do that to your hands? Why did you? Yeah, of course, because you're a woman. I can't touch you. You know, some psychiatrist would have a great deal to say about this in ways that I can't say, but there's definitely something not very healthy going on there. But there are no such stories about Anthony. Although he goes to extremes, there's a moderation about his self denial, his asceticism. It's interesting because it's almost like the asceticism, which is viewed as a tool to or or a path to get closer to God, it becomes almost the destination instead of the road. Yeah. Because, you know, one quote I remember from St. Anthony the Great is him talking about temptation, and I'm repeating it from memory, but basically he says you have to have temptation in order to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, without temptation, no one can be saved. And it's, he viewed his asceticism as a way to get closer to God, but not the actual goal of what he was doing, I would think. Yeah, well, that's the point, And that's a very good way to put it. Yes, a lot of these desert hermits did indeed put the cart before the horse, so to speak. And for many of them, self-denial be also became a competition. You know, who can eat the least? Who can go with the fewest hours of sleep? And so on. And this was not good. This was not healthy. 
And in a way, you know, it's it's sort of misanthropic, not only in the sense that you're doing damage to yourself and making yourself miserable, but this is a way of shunning the rest of the Christian community and passing yourself off as somehow better than them. That has always been a constant tension in Christian history. How do monastics relate to the rest of the Christian community, and what role do they serve for the Christian community? Sure, their prayer helps everybody, and they are role models for self-control, but it's not hard to figure out why in the Christian monastic tradition, the greatest virtue within the monastic tradition, in monastic theology, greatest virtue was humility, right? Because it's very easy to get all puffed up and all and very proud about your accomplishments. Hey, I, I only go to sleep for two hours a night. How many hours do you sleep? <laughs> and that's not the point, right? As you put it, the point is to transcend the worst inclinations in your nature. Open yourself up to encounter the divine. But, you know, a point that has come up many times before in our discussions of other mystics is also part of St. Anthony's story, which is that there's a very, very sort of strong emphasis on purity, on God being so pure, so holy, so good, right? That in order to encounter God, one needs to have reach a certain level of purity, which means sinlessness, to be as sinless as possible. And this is a subject we can return to another time. But the fact is, it's a paradox, right? Because in the monastic tradition, including Anthony himself, one never ceases to be tempted. One never ceases to commit sins in one's own mind, especially. But one commits fewer sins. One gets to to be more ethical, closer to Jesus. But it's impossible not to sin. You just don't sin as much as everybody else. (laughs) But you can't consider yourself better than others, because that's that's pride. And pride is the worst sin, because all sins flow from pride, according to monastic theology. And Adam and Eve are pointed to as the prime example of of this relationship between pride and sin. What made them eat the fruit? Pride. Haughtiness. They wanted to be like God. That's what the serpent promised them. And, you know, and we go on from there to other monastics and other mystics. Being humble is absolutely necessary. But in the meantime, while you're humble, you can trounce the best philosophers and theologians in Alexandria, Egypt, (laughs) when you go to discuss things with them. (laughs) But you don't want to go around boasting about it. Oh, I'm the best. I'm number one. Yeah, no, you don't do that. I think that quote from St. Anthony that I mentioned earlier kind of uh, points out an, an irony that, you know, for some of these monastics that took pride in, in their asceticism and, and took pride in the way they deprived themselves and believed that made them holier than others. It's an irony that in their quest to rid themselves of human nature, it was human nature that sunk them, the human nature to be prideful, to put oneself above everyone else. Right. And uh, I, I think that's – God has a, uh, a very developed sense of humor – Yes, and and humans do too, in response to God's humor, have very mixed feelings often, right? Or ambivalent feelings towards themselves, because it's very difficult to handle mixed emotions. And, you know, when you get down to it, so much of this quest for the divine is emotional, and in mystic after mystic that we've talked about before, you know, love, love plays such an important role in the mystical quest. And love is an emotion. But pride and humility are also emotions. So how to handle this mix of, you know, 
you know you're close to God. You're having very close experiences with the divine. You're, you know, you're transcending this world. And many of them, at least the ones that we can study, they've written about it or talked about it and become role models for others. How does, and let's call them successful. Just as in business, people are successful and you measure their success by, by how much money they make. In the case of monastics, and most mystics that are known to be mystics are monastics who wrote about it. So for them, how do you measure their success? Their success is mystical experiences. Yet they can't be boastful about them. Others can boast for you. <laughs> as Athanasius does for Anthony, and all hagiographers do for the saints whose lives they're writing about. But it's a difficult balancing act, very difficult. Anthony apparently was very humble. And, well, up until the very end, past 100, continued being the same kind of humble, retiring, self-denying hermit that he had always been despite all the attention paid to him. But of course, that's how Athanasius writes the the history, right? I think if we had a time machine and a 21st century biographer could go back to the 3rd and 4th century and tell the story of Anthony, it would be interesting to see what differences there would be in the writing of that story, given our sensibilities, right? Because that's... uh, 1,700 years ago, almost two millennia, and so much has changed. And one thing that I thought I would mention earlier that needs to be mentioned about Anthony and his contemporaries is that one should never forget that in their time, human beings were killing each other for sport in the arena. This was sport, right? There was slavery. And many of those who ended up fighting in the arena were slaves. There are public spectacles where, you know, hundreds in Rome, especially, but also in the provinces, you know, where animals would be slaughtered in the arena in the hundreds. And people went and watched this for entertainment. The cruelty of this world that Athanasius and Anthony lived in was just incredible to us. Unbelievable. Although I think there are some places on earth where, yeah, they still have public executions. That's the kind of inclination in human nature that Anthony is countering or being the opposite of. When we look back at these figures in the church, the church fathers, these mystics, and the times that they lived in, you really have to keep in mind what a totally different world they existed in. Right. Where, as you mentioned, killing humans and for sport was perfectly not only accepted, it was enjoyed. It was popular, yes. Yeah. You have to think about the world in which these people lived in, where human life did not have the same worth. Uh, any life did not have the same worth. And they still struggled and they still fought for respecting life and respecting the spirit of God within every man. And you think being, if if anyone out there thinks being a mystic is hard today, imagine being a mystic in that world. Right. And over 40 years of Anthony's life, Christians were being persecuted on top of all this. And when he went out to the desert, they were, they were still being persecuted. And in some of these events where animals would get killed, humans got killed too. I mean, they'd be sent, they'd send gladiators out to fight the beasts, but sometimes the beasts won. So we're talking about a social and political system which was based on cruelty and pride. So this is why St. Augustine, who was so powerfully impressed by Anthony in his City of God, his book City of God, at one point he asks the rhetorical question, what is the difference between a small boat full of pirates and the Roman Empire? And the answer is size. (laughs) They're both acting in exactly the same way. 
They're just attacking everybody and seizing their property and using violence and cruelty to get their way. It's just size, you know. Augustine is writing sort of towards the end of the Roman Empire and the West. Caesar's like the captain of a pirate ship, except, you know, he's got thousands of ships and hundreds of thousands of pirates fighting for him, stealing other people's stuff, killing other people. This is something about the early Christians that you know, we always need to keep in mind. And for all mystics, all mystics in many ways feel at odds with the world in which they live. They see the things in the world that are inhumane, and they're bothered by it, which is one of the reasons that they shy away from the world. And many of them after, I mean, St. Catherine of Siena is a good example. Somebody who lived through a period of extreme self-denial and had all these mystical experiences. And then what happens after a certain point? She devotes her life to helping people in the world deal with all this cruelty. She devotes herself to it. So mysticism is not all about me, right? It's not all about selfishness. There one student I had in class many years ago, when I was still at the University of Virginia, made a comment that I think is one of the wisest comments I have ever heard a student make. Kind of like St. Anthony, going to the philosophers, to debate the philosophers. Here I am teaching this course on mysticism, and he put me in my place. He said, you know, Professor, all these people we're reading, they're constantly talking about selflessness, but they are the more most self-obsessed people I have ever read, <laughs> which in a way is true. But in most cases, even these self-obsessed mystics, their whole point is to cut themselves off from a world full of cruelties and to have a, an intimate relationship with the divine so that they can turn around and do good things in a very, very imperfect and often very, very cruel and violent world. And I would say my big takeaway from this conversation that we've had on St. Anthony the Great is despite the fact that he lived in such a horrible, violent, dangerous world, he kept that humility. He kept that subservience to God and focus on God. And despite his popularity and despite trouncing all these philosophers and being looked at as someone very wise with his infused knowledge, it doesn't appear that it ever went to his head, that he stuck to it, and he kept his focus on the divine and on God, which can't be said about the many that followed him over the centuries. The, the history of monasticism is a, a history of constant failures and constant reforms. Because try to get away from the world as much as they want to get away from the world, at least in the beginning. The world filters in, in many ways. And this is why, you know, you end up with so many reformers in the monastic tradition. And so many of the greatest mystics were reformers. Yeah, two prime examples, St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross at a third. They were furiously, furiously trying to reform monasticism because things had gone wrong. And I wouldn't even say that the world snuck in. It, it's almost like they created their own version of the world within these societies. Yeah, they did. And especially, you know, when we keep in mind that for many, many centuries in the Middle Ages and, and later too, monasteries were places where the nobility and the wealthy would send their excess children in order to not to have to give part of the inheritance to too many children. And that created all sorts of problems. Uh, imagine being dropped off at a monastery at age six or eight. Say, okay, here, you'll be a monk. Oh, fine, you'll be a nun. Uh, what kind of commitment is anybody going to have? Well, as the youngest of my parents' children, <laughs> <laughs> That probably would have me a little nervous. Well, yeah, you would have been the one. You would have been either the monk or the family priest. Back in Spain, for sure. You know, there are parts of Spain 
where uh, inheritance is divided equally among all children. It's not true of all of Spain, but only certain parts. But imagine in a society like that, yes, they have to somehow uh, keep the slices and the pie as large as possible. <laughs> oh, you go off and be a monk or a nun or a priest. Here. Bye. Well, well, I think St. Anthony sets a good example, but uh, not on those terms. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And, you know, and something else to remember when it comes to monasticism and celibacy in earlier societies, others than our own. Marriages for most of human history have not been about love. They have been about property. And so many cultures on earth have had arranged marriages for precisely those reasons. So going off into the desert, in addition to also possibly being a way of escaping your creditors, it's a way of escaping a, an arranged marriage. Well, I guess perhaps we don't know the exact reason why St. Anthony went off into the desert, <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad he, he did, and I'm glad St. Athanasius was able to document his life and his mysticism and give us the material for another great episode. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is the 12th month of our first year uh, with the Christian mysticism episode. So that means we have one left, which is going to fall right before Christmas. So to let our listeners know, Carlos and I discussed this a few days ago, and we've decided to put together a mystical Christmas episode for you guys on the next one. Yes, mysticism and Christmas. What's the connection there? That's what we'll explore next time. Well, it will come at the right time. And until the next time, thank you for listening to the Christian Mysticism Podcast. If you have any questions for Dr. Ayer, you'll find our email address in the show notes. Just send it over and we'll try to answer it in a future episode. And don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the Christian Mysticism Podcast. <music>